Thank you very much. Um, for those of you who uh, uh, are on Facebook, you can go to the bar for the next 15 minutes and come back for the interesting stuff. But for the five of you who aren't on Facebook here, uh, I'm going to confirm all your worst suspicions. So <laughs> anyway, uh, when Facebook was launched, it was kind of launched as uh, the, the, the sort of antidote to, 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 to sociality. You would sort of be able to enlarge your social world uh, potentially to the entire rest of the planet. Uh, and that was, that was the kind of promissory note on the tin can, as it were. And the question is, has that actually happened? Lots of people will tell you they know people who've got thousands of friends on Facebook, and Facebook will allow you to have up to 5,000. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it seems uh, you can't actually break the basic rules of ev our evolutionary history. And indeed, Facebook themselves have discovered uh, that the average number of friends on people's Facebook pages is almost exactly 150, and that's on their sort of half billion sample. Um, but these are quite nice data, because they explain why this is so, in a way. Th these are some of um, Facebook's own data. Uh, and what they uh, have done here is look at different ways of classifying friendships in terms of uh, the traffic that goes on between people talking on each other's walls. So that's all the three different things. The girls in pink, the blue uh, is the boys. And these are people who've got 50 friends listed, 150 friends or so, and 500 or so friends. And the point is, the total number of friends is increasing tenfold, but the number of people you really talk to uh, doesn't increase anything like that. In fact, it's pretty much sandwiched around this sort of area of 5 to 15 core friends. So if you like, Facebook themselves have um, uh, proved the point very nicely, thank you. But let me explain why that's so. Uh, it goes back to these data here, which are a plot of mean social group size in monkeys and apes plotted against a measure of the brain. It, you can almost, it turns out, use any uh, bit of the brain, it's fine. These are the monkeys here, these are the apes. The point is, species that live in very big groups here have relatively large brains uh, compared to species that live in, in small groups. And the apes are kind of over here because they're having to work harder, it seems. They need a bigger computer to manage the same number of relationships that monkeys can manage with a smaller brain because they're kind of cognitively and socially more complex, if you like. So if we plug humans in here, we have a, this, this is actually neocortex ratio, which is just the ratio of the this neocortex, the sort of smart bit of the brain, to the size of the rest of the brain. We can plug us in here, about 80% of our brain is neocortex. Uh, when we read across from the ape line, it gives us this value of 150. It's now known as Dunbar's number. Ironically, it was christened Dunbar's number on Facebook. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you can look around now at, at, at sort of different kinds of data in the world, and sure enough, it turns out that this is extremely common. Here's just a little selection of sort of casual examples. I kind of like this one, uh, Gore-Tex, because uh, everybody wears Gore-Tex, an incredibly successful company. The way they manage their company is completely different to the way everybody else does it. So when other companies expand in size, they increase the size of their factories and so on, and they get more and more layers. What Gore-Tex did, was just build a new factory on the parking lot next door, which was completely self-contained. Each factory is 150 and no more. And therefore, you have no reason to have hierarchies, no management hierarchy. Everybody has the same label on their jacket, just says Gore-Tex Associate. And it's attributed to this unique management structure, the fact that they're so successful as, as a company, uh, incredibly successful. Um, these are sort of data from, uh, Rosie mentioned, uh, tr traditional small-scale society, uh, oh, and things have slipped, but never mind. Um, uh, the red values here, so these are census data from traditional small-scale societies. These are kind of camp groups, uh, tribal groups, uh, what are known as megabands, and these are clans, the groups of people that sort of have quite intense relationships with each other in these small-scale societies. And that turns out to be exactly 150 on average. Here they are, about here. And this was our first attempt to look at this in kind of us, as it were, here in the Western world. It was look, just looking at the number of people who you sent Christmas cards to and who received the Christmas cards. Uh, and that turns out people send about 70 cards on average 
the average number of recipients is almost exactly 150, give or take. There are, there are you know, sort of lots of variation around that. This is sort of a range from about 10, which is uh, Mr. No Mates, me down here with uh, uh, nobody to send cars to. This is Roy Rosie up here with 300 uh, friends. And the reason Rosie has more friends than me is the fact that the bit of her brain that handles these social things, which is this bit up here just over the front of the eye, is bigger than my bit of the brain. So it turns out that there's a very strong relationship between the size of this bit of the brain in particular, this bit just above the eyes, your ability to handle, to mind read essentially, to understand other individuals' minds, and the number of friends you have, particularly in the sort of inner core set of about 15 sort of, if you like, best friends. Um, and it, it, this, it's, it's almost as though the size of the computer determines the software, which in turn determines how many friends you can manage and keep sort of uh, going at the same time, as it were. Um, <clears throat> in terms of actually how friendships are made, if we go back to what happens in the monkeys and apes, it's a two-step process, really. It involves a lot of this kind of stuff, grooming. We still do it. What, it, what grooming does is it's actually it's not about sort of fleas and the like, it's about uh, essentially massage, and it, 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 you might like to think of it, uh, uh, cut, cut, cuddling and patting and petting kind of thing, and it's, it becomes quite painful. It triggers the release of endorphins in the brain, which are the brain's own painkillers, and these kind of give you that sense of relaxation and happiness and contentedness with these people that you're doing this with, and from that you can build a relationship of trust and kind of reciprocity and so on. So this is very fundamentally important to the inner core of relationships we have. It's very time consuming. Let me just illustrate for you how time consuming it actually is. Uh, at the center of your social world, so you, you, your sort of social world consists of these 150 people, but it's a sort of series of layers of friendship coming in, and right at the center is a little core group of five intimate friends. It's pretty much five for everybody. Again, there's variation around that, but the average is five. And here we are, we're, we're asking people to list all their uh, best friends and intimate friends, as it were, the average here very nicely at five, a lot of variation around that. Uh, these are people who are not in a romantic relationship. When you're in a romantic relationship, you only have four. <laughs> and that's, bec <laughs> that's clearly because romantic relationships involve a lot of time. They're very focused. Uh, you, you're, all your attention and time is devoted to this one person. You just don't have the time to spend with everybody in your original five, particularly as that person who's just come into your life has not come in from that inner five. They've come in from way outside. So what you've actually done is add a sixth person in here. So just to show you how costly romantic relationships are, they cost you two friends, basically. <laughs> What's quite neat, actually, is we sacrifice... I mean, this inner core of five typically consists of two friends and two family uh, members. What people do when they sacrifice these two friends is they sacrifice one family member, one friend. Now, if you think about it, that's really clever because you need your family to, there for the long term. They're the ones that are going to support you throughout your whole life and come and rescue you and, uh, when things are, fall apart and all this kind of thing. But the trouble is, when this relationship falls apart, they're just going to say to you, get a grip, move on, find another. What you need is some shoulders to cry on, and that's what friends are for. So if you sacrifice both your two friends out of that core group, but you've got nobody to, you know, shoulders to cry on. So people are very smart, it turns out. They sacrifice one family member, so they at least keep one family member happy to rescue them in the long term, and one friend uh, for the shoulder to cry on in due course when you need it, as it were. All right, so how do we keep these relationships going? Well, it turns out there's a big difference between the boys and the girls on this. This is a, a long-term study we did over 18 months looking at what it was that prevented relationships declining with time. So this is uh, time spent in conversation, essentially, how often you talk to them. Uh, uh, this is uh, less now than you used to, and, and the effect that has on the average emotional closeness here uh, to that relationship, a very simple measure of emotional closeness. It's about the same now as you always did, or you do more now. And you will notice that, in general, if you do less, uh, friendships decline, not family relationships, but friendships decline in quality over time. Uh, talking more helps keep them up. But what's kind of interesting is this sex difference here. You'll notice that talking is very beneficial for girls' relationships. It keeps them going through time. It actually has a negative effect on... <laughs> 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 
What, you may ask, keeps boys' relationships going? Okay, I'm, I have a consultancy booth outside afterwards, if you're in need. It's banging heads together. Because the other question we asked of these, the sample of people is, well, how often do you, not only how often do you talk to them, but have you been out with them, have you been shopping with them, have you been on holiday with them, have you done stuff together? And you'll notice the complete opposite. What keeps boys' relationships going over time is banging heads together. Uh, banging heads together apparently has a negative effect on girls' relationships. So we do live in sort of two different worlds. Uh, but I, I put it to you that this explains why the urban myth that girls spend an hour on the phone each day uh, on a single conversation is actually true because this, the technology is actually beautifully designed, as indeed things like Facebook are, for the way they service their relationships. Uh, it's absolutely useless for boys. Uh, and this explains why boys' phone calls only last 7.3 seconds on average. <laughs> because all they need to do is say, I'll see you down the pub at 7 o'clock. Uh, what else is there to say? <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so part and parcel of this, and one of the reasons why actually doing stuff together face-to-face -to -face actually is important, and this is why Facebook really doesn't work particularly well in, in terms of enlarging your social life. It's very good for some things, but it doesn't really act as a real social lubricant is that a lot of it, our social interactions have to do with laughter. So this is a series of experiments. I think there were oh, five, I think we did six in the end altogether, uh, in which we, we remember endorphins are part of the pain control system in the brain. So they're pumped out whenever you have pain. So we have a very simple test. We give people one of these kind of old-fashioned blood monitor things. How long can you stand the pain? It's a measure of their pain tolerance. They watch a video, uh, and then they redo a pain test. Now, if endorphins are pumped out by that activity, watching the video, uh, pain threshold should increase across here. It should be higher here than it is here. If there's no effect of it, there's no endorphins being pumped out, there'll be no difference, or there'll be decrease in pain thresholds. Anyway, so what we do, uh, we... Um, uh, get the, some people here, and this, this one I really love because we did it live at the Edinburgh Fringe, watching stand-up comedy. This group, they were watching small dramas. But all this group here are watching uh, videos of famous comedians. <laughs> and, and pitted against that, so you really do make them laugh, Joe. <laughs> um, uh, pitted against that, we want something that won't make people laugh, and our best discovery for what that is, is golfing instruction videos. <laughs> there you go. And you will see that here's zero, so here's where there's no change in pain tolerance across uh, this watching the video. And you can see all the laughter ones are up here, they're all positive, there's an increase in pain tolerance. All the sort of controls here are negative. And here really is the catch to why uh, things like Facebook really aren't, don't work as well as you might expect them to. This is a study we did looking at people's happiness ratings, their satisfaction with a particular interaction with one of their five closest friends, either face-to-face, -face, by Skype, by phone, uh, by uh, instant messaging, by text, or by email stroke uh, social networking sites. And you can see that there's something about Skype and particularly face-to-face -face which produces a much higher rating of satisfaction. And it turns out that one of the reasons for that is they're much better at making you laugh. So even if you look at whether or not laughter occurs, and indeed the satisfaction is a function of laughter, uh, you can have virtual laughter in here, emoticons or things like that. That actually makes you feel better after the exchange. But there's nothing like seeing the whites of their eyes, basically, in terms of creating this sort of uh, a sense of satisfaction with the whole thing. So, thank you very much. <laughs>